Well, good morning and welcome home to Modern Worship at Grace Avenue. My name is Wendy Child and I'm the worship leader here for this faith community. Well, as people keep trickling in this morning and joining our online feed, we like to do something called virtual passing of the peace. So if you saw someone's name flash up on the side that you haven't said hey to in a while, go ahead and just tag them in a comment and say good morning. Or if you wanna tell us where you are and where you're worshiping from today, we would love to get to say hey to you. So a lot of you have probably noticed that our music is mostly pre-recorded, and we are so blessed that we have the technology to be able to do that. So we've had different bands and different band members over the past few months come in and get to worship together, so that is amazing. This morning, we have a very special treat because our U-Turn band, which is our youth band, a couple weeks ago did a recording of a bunch of their favorite songs. So today, we are gonna get to worship with them. So as we continue in worship today, let's join with our youth band and we're gonna sing Reckless Love.
mountain you won't climb I'm coming after me It's no wall you won't kick down Lie you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain you won't climb I'm coming after me Good morning and welcome home to Modern Worship at Grace Avenue. If Grace Avenue is your church home, we invite you to register your attendance with us this morning using the link in the comment section. If you are new to our worship experiences, um, if this is the first time you found us at Modern Worship, I wanna invite you to send an email to Pastor Jessica at jessica at graceavenue.org and just introduce yourself and say hi. She'd love to connect with you and get to know you um, in a new way. We have a couple of quick announcements before we continue on in worship today. The first is we have our next children's camp coming up, which is our virtual vacation Bible camp. It starts um, this week online. Um, Registration is encouraged, but not required. Um, if your child wants to participate, all they need to do is go to the Kids on Grace Avenue Facebook page, and they can see a video that we posted live there every day between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. We hope that your uh, students in uh, K through fifth grade will enjoy participating in that. We have our second Soul Care Sunday this week, and um, we'll be talking about prayer. Um, and we have next week the opportunity to talk about meditation. We'll also be diving deep into those on Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock um, with prayer and meditation experiences as well. So we hope you'll join us immediately after the service today for our Soul Care Sunday and that you'll dive deep with us on Tuesday as well. And now we're going to continue our time of worship together. We invite you to grab a candle if you don't have one already and place it in a centralized location where you can see it. And we light a candle every week to remind us that God's presence is with us. And so even though we are worshiping and we're socially distanced during this time, we know that the Holy Spirit is still uniting us as one. And so at this time, I invite you to light your candle. Here in Modern at Grace Avenue, we gather as a united community from all walks of life. Without exception, we belong. We affirm and embrace people from every race, ethnicity, age, economic status, marital status, gender or sexual identity, ability, or faith background, because all people reflect the face of God. Without exception, we belong. We seek to embody God's grace and justice in our community and in our world. And we recognize that historically the church hasn't always done that. Part of our work together is to help right some of those wrongs. Without, Without exception, exception, we belong. In this space, we bring our full selves. We engage our minds. We struggle with our doubts. We cultivate sustainability. And we carry one another's burdens. Without, Without exception, exception, we belong. belong. I was 
When you pray, don't be like hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you pray, go to your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't pour out a flood of empty words as the Gentiles do. They think that by saying many words, they'll be heard. Don't be like them, because your Father knows what you need before you ask. Pray like this. Our Father who is in heaven, uphold the holiness of your name. Bring in your kingdom, so that, you, so that your will is done on earth as it's done in heaven. Give us the bread that we need for today. Forgive us for the ways we've, we have wronged you, just as we also forgive those who have wrong who have wronged us and don't lead us into temptation but rescue us from the evil one 
If you forgive others their sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your sins. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, hello again, everybody. My name is Christopher Vaughn. I'm one of the co-pastors of Modern Worship here at Grace Avenue, and I am privileged to be with you today as we hear the Word of God. Um, We are continuing our scripture study this morning on the Sermon on the Mount. Last week, we looked at the Beatitudes, and if you um, missed that worship service, you can actually uh, see it at any time on our Facebook page, um, so you can go back and watch it. This week, we find ourselves hearing the familiar words of the Lord's Prayer but also this rebuke at the beginning of how, when, and what to pray about. If you look at the context of Matthew 6 and what comes before and after it, you'll see that Jesus made it clear that we often do the right thing for the wrong reason. Jesus noted that the religious leaders practiced their piety in such a way as to be noticed by others. He said, in essence, they pray and fast and help the poor, but they do it so people will notice and praise them. Jesus taught his hearers that if they did the same things but in secret so that others might not see, then their acts would truly be for God. And he taught, in other words, that our motives are just as important as our actions, which was the very point he was making in Matthew 5 um, when he reinterpreted the law of Moses. I suspect that all of us have been guilty at some time or another of doing good in order to be noticed. When we give to charitable organizations, do we agree to have our names listed among the donors? How often do we give because we feel the need for people to know about it? When we fast at Lent, do we make a Facebook post about it so that people will know that we're fasting and how hard and how difficult it is? We do good things that are good and noble, but the ideal and what we strive for as we grow in our faith is to do these things as an offering to God and not to get praise from other people. Simply saying it's for the sake of helping others, not for the sake of having other people know that we're helping others. Those with real spiritual maturity don't look for a reward except for the knowledge that someone has been helped through their donation, that God has heard the cries of their heart during Lent, or that their prayers opened them up to God's Spirit. And so Jesus gives us this challenge in our verses today of not living our faith lives in such a way that we are seeking praise and affirmation from each other, but instead living in such a way that we are seeking our praise and affirmation from God. And then Jesus teaches us how we should pray or talk to God by offering a simple and yet complex and powerful prayer. And I've been thinking a lot about how we pray and why we pray and the misconceptions that a lot of us have about prayer. And I think we need a holy shift in how we think about prayer. I saw on Facebook recently a story about a family who in quarantine has developed the hobby of putting puzzles together. The dad put out a post on Facebook asking to borrow puzzles from friends and he regularly brings home puzzles of greater and greater difficulty. One night he and his family began to work on a puzzle that he brought at home that was over a thousand pieces. And immediately they were very excited. But after an hour, the family was super frustrated. No matter how hard they tried, they couldn't get the puzzle started. The father then discovered that the friend he had borrowed the puzzle from had accidentally switched the box tops. And so they were looking at a picture from another puzzle. It wasn't the puzzle that they were working on and it made it impossible for them to figure it out. And I think a lot of us feel that way when it comes to prayer. We think we know how prayer works or what prayer is supposed to look like and what it's supposed to accomplish and then we try and pray and we feel like we're looking at the wrong puzzle with the wrong box. We start thinking that we're praying for the wrong things or we are not wanting to bother God with our petty problems when there's this whole world of people who have greater needs than ours. And I think that's because most of us have a fundamental misunderstanding of what prayer is. So I want to get these common misconceptions about prayer a rebuttal. You do not need to have specific holy words or religious phrases to pray. You do not need specific objects to pray. You do not have to pray in a specific place. Any place that you spend time with God is holy ground. You do not have to have someone else pray for you. No one is more important to God than you are. And just because you think that so-and-so 
has a stronger faith in you, that doesn't make their prayers any more powerful than yours. You do not have to pray a long prayer. The Lord's Prayer that we read today in our scripture is actually rather short. You do not have to pray a beautiful, eloquent prayer. Just speak from your heart. There is no perfect prayer, no perfect formula. The important thing is that you take time to pray. This week, Benjamin, my four-year-old son, and I were having a conversation about prayer, and I recorded just a bit of it to share with you. Let's take a look. So um, I thought it would be really fun to get Benjamin's perspective on prayer. Benjamin, are you ready to talk? Uh-huh. All right, so Benjamin, what is prayer? It's something where you talk to God. It's where you talk to God. And so how do you talk to God when you pray? Um, I don't really know. I don't really understand. So when you pray, uh, what do you pray for? Let's ask it that way. Um, I pray for our food and my family. For your food and your family? Do you pray for anything else? Uh, um, I also pray for the flowers. You pray for flowers, okay. And when do you typically pray? At night time and at a meal time. But, and also in the, just right when the morning begins. You pray when the morning begins? When you pray in the morning begins, what do you pray for? The flowers. The flowers? Okay, you said, Daddy, I already said that, the flowers. Um, earlier today, you also told me you like to pray for animals too. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you pray, do you think God listens? Yeah. He always listens. He does. And would you say that your prayers are answered? Do you say that God answers your prayers or talks back to you sometimes? Um, he always answers them. Um, every single time I say prayers, I just can't really hear him. Oh, okay. Because God, we can't, we can't hear his voice. Yeah, we don't always verbally hear God's voice. That's true. Benjamin gives us a great perspective on prayer. Prayer is how we talk to God. It's deliberate communication with the divine. It's how we build our connection and relationship with God. But I think too often we simplify our prayers to only cover the three F's of friends, family, and food. Benjamin would add a fourth to that, that he would want flowers in there too, but most of us aren't praying for flowers. But maybe we should. Prayer is about so much more than what most of us think. When Jesus begins teaching about prayer in the scripture we read today, he says, when you pray. The assumption is not if we are going to pray, but when. And then he leads us in the prayer that we still recite together almost every Sunday. Prayer is something that some of us feel intimidated by. But you never have to be shy or hesitant in your prayers. The Bible tells us that we can come to God in prayer with a confident spirit. Prayer is meant to be a time to find true connection from a willing God who is always listening to us and caring for us. Do you need to pray about something? Do you or someone you know or love, are they COVID-19 positive and they need healing? You or someone you know has lost their job and is struggling? You or someone you know who has become fearful and anxious in this pandemic? You or someone you know who is struggling mentally and just needs help? you or someone you know who is lost and needs connection. There could be a thousand reasons why we need to pray, and it's always about so much more than we realize. God is calling us to a holy shift in the way that we think about prayer, and Jessica is going to help us see how we can take that prayer and bring it into action.
riches, riches I heed not, nor men's empty praise. Thou my inheritance now and always. Thou and thou only the first in my heart. I King of heaven, my treasure. The Lord's Prayer is an incredibly famous prayer that Christians all around the world say every Sunday. And we say it every Sunday, but sometimes I wonder, do we really mean what we are praying? I know for me, I've said the Lord's Prayer so many times. I'm so familiar with it that when I say it, sometimes I'm just going through the motions. 2020 has been a horrible year. It is a horrible year. And I don't need to recount the specifics because you are living it. The weight of it all, how heavy and hard things are in our lives right now, we find ourselves at a loss of for words. We really don't know what to pray or how to pray. And so this morning, I invite us to slow down and reflect on the powerful words of the Lord's Prayer. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus gives us a timeless prayer, a prayer that has sustained and helped Christians through every age and every crisis. In the Lord's Prayer, Jesus teaches us how to pray and what to pray. He begins by praying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. If you've ever wondered what hallowed be, this fancy, maybe Latin word, I don't know, another word for hallowed is holy. The first thing Jesus does in prayer is he praises God's holy name. And then he prays, Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Notice that before Jesus asks for his daily bread, before he addresses any of his needs to God, the first thing that Jesus prays is that God's holy name be glorified and that God's will be done. The focus of Jesus' prayer is not on himself, but on God. How many times do we go to God in prayer and the first thing out of our mouths is what we need, our desires, our goals, or maybe just empty words? So often we go through life as Christians asking God to bless our plans, right? To put God's stamp of approval on our dreams, our hopes, our wishes, before ever considering God's plan for our lives. 
On the night of the Last Supper, before Jesus was arrested, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. In the Gospel of Matthew, it says, Jesus said to his disciples, I'm very sad and anxious. It's as if I'm dying. Stay here and keep alert with me. Then he went a short distance further and fell on his face and prayed. My father, if it's possible, take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not what I want, but what you want. Not what I want, but what you want. Total surrender. What we learn from Jesus in his most vulnerable moment is that prayer is not so much about us presenting our wishes to God in hopes that God will bless them. Rather, prayer is about aligning our hearts and our plans with God's. Even when we don't understand, even when it involves suffering and sacrifice, total surrender. Total surrender is the difference between someone who is a fan of Jesus and someone who is a follower of Jesus. A fan will try and accept the invitation to follow Jesus, but they don't want to say no to themselves. We talk a lot about the truth that being a Christian means believing in Jesus, but we really don't talk a lot about denying ourselves. Because it's such an unappealing message. How do you deny yourself in a culture that says it's all about you? Sometimes we treat Christianity like Burger King, have it your way. Remember the story of the rich young ruler? He wanted to say yes to following Jesus without saying no to himself. He wanted to be close enough to Jesus to have eternal life, but not so close that he had to sacrifice some things. For me, back in the good old days when you could just go to the gym, I would work out three or four times a week, man, and I wanted to get in shape. I wanted to eat healthy. I wanted to feel good. And so I would kill myself in the gym for an hour. I would have like sweat dripping down my back. I'm red in the face. I look like I'm about to just pass out. And I get in my car and I'm on my way to go have brunch with friends. And the sad part is that as I am in the car, I'm already thinking about what I'm going to order. I'm going to get me some pancakes. I'm going to get me a bacon and cheese omelet, vanilla iced coffee. I'm making you hungry, right? But I already was planning what I was going to eat. And so I set these horrible habits where I would crush myself in the gym, but I didn't want to make any sacrifice to my diet. I was still eating junk food. And I think that's so many of us, right? How many of us want to get in shape? We want to be healthy, but we don't want to make any sacrifice. If we are going to be followers and not just fans of Christ, and we cannot say, thy kingdom come if I'm unwilling to give up my own plans and surrender to the righteous reign of God. I cannot say on earth as it is in heaven unless I am truly ready to live in such a way that reflects God's kingdom. I cannot say thine is the glory if I'm still seeking my own glory first. I cannot say amen to the Lord's prayer unless I honestly say, cost what it may, this is my prayer. Imagine what kind of holy shift would happen in our lives if we prayed, not my will, God, but yours be done. Not mine, but yours. I was, I was thinking about this last night of why don't we pray that prayer? Why don't we embody the Lord's prayer? And I think it's because so many of us, 
are afraid that if we surrender our plans, our lives to God, that we would somehow be not as happy or less satisfied. But what I've already learned in life is the things that I thought would make me happy don't satisfy the soul. And that is why Jesus invites us into a new way of life, a spiritual and an eternal kingdom centered in God. That's why in the Beatitudes it says, happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the peacemakers. And so I invite you to ask God, God, what do I need to let go of? How can I decenter my will and recenter your will in my life? To pray, not my will, but yours, God, is a challenging spiritual discipline. But God promises in Matthew 6, when you and I say, and when we seek the kingdom of God above all else, when we put God first and embody, not just say the Lord's Prayer, but embody the Lord's Prayer, God promises that we will have everything we need. Everything we need. Doesn't say in everything we want, but everything we need. And now we're going to prepare for our time of prayer together. As we do, I want to invite you in the comments section to lift up somebody you know, a student, a teacher, an administrator, a staff member, who's having to make difficult decisions about school this fall. Whether they're trying to decide whether to go or not to go or open or when to open, just lift somebody up uh, with the first name uh, who's having to make these difficult choices. I also want to invite you to lift up somebody that you know um, that you've missed connecting with. Maybe somebody from our modern family, maybe somebody uh, in your own personal family, somebody who during the time of the pandemic you just haven't got to connect with and a prayer of increasing that connection this morning. So if you'll lift those names up in the comments section. And now I hope you'll join with me in prayer. Let us pray. God of hot summer days, Thank you for leading us to moments of joy, delightful surprises and blessings to celebrate. We are grateful for music that opens our souls to worship you more fully. We thank you for our musicians who faithfully serve. We thank you for our wonderful staff that helps pull all of these worship experiences together for our current reality. Lord, your scripture teaches us that you are also with us in the struggle. And there are so many struggles. Our fight with the coronavirus persists as infection numbers continue to rise. In addition to the physical risk we face, mental health is a challenge for many. People are grieving the loss of loved ones and they are suffering economically. Frustration and conflict are erupting in public spaces. Leaders are wrestling with how to lead. We need your guidance. We need your wisdom. And, O oh Lord, as well as the willingness to do what is best for us all. Give us patience with and compassion for one another so that we can get through this together. Gracious God, make your presence known in our ongoing struggle with racism in this country and around the world. Help us to really listen to the lived experiences of others, to ask the hard questions, and to change what needs to be changed. Grant intelligence and generosity to lawmakers and business leaders so that as they make decisions, they consider the implications for people of color. Grant imagination and passion to educators and artists who inspire us towards new possibilities. Empower your church with the Holy Spirit to proclaim and live the gospel in a world of struggle. Help churches find ways of cooperating to care for your people and to provide an alternative voice and the challenges of our times. Because you are with us in all of these struggles, we bring these prayers to you with the confidence that you have heard them and lovingly care for them. 
And today, Modern Family, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, we say it together with some of the children from our congregation. Let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. And I hope that you enjoy the amen at the end because those are two of my favorite children, Benjamin and Hattie, um, my own, that will be sharing in that. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against, against us. us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Yay! Let us continue in worship through our offering. We pause just to remind ourselves that God is the source of all of life's blessings, and so we give God thanks for that today. We believe that we are called to make a difference in our local community and in our world, and we do that through your generosity. And so we invite you to give, and there's a couple of ways that you uh, can do that. You can do that through the link that will appear in the comment section below. You can set up a recurring gift, or you can text in your gift, mail it, or bring it by the church. Friends, God has been so good to us, and so let us be good to God in our offering today. Children and their children and their children. God's favor is upon. 
and their children and their children, yeah. Well, church family, it's been great to be with you this week as we worship God together. I want to remind you about our Soul Care Sundays that happen immediately after the service. There'll be a Zoom link in the comments section. You can go ahead and click that and you can join Wendy, Jessica, and myself in the Zoom call. Today, we'll be um, having a conversation that revolves around prayer. As we prepare to depart today, um, the challenge that I give you is this. Prayer is our connection to the divine. It's our way of increasing our relationship with God, and there are no obstacles between us and God in prayer other than the things that we put in front of us. So our reminder today from Jessica and myself is that prayer is powerful. And what we wanna challenge you to do this week is to read the Lord's Prayer every day and to really think about what that means for you and your life and are you really doing what the prayer is calling you to do? Go forth with the blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And wherever life takes you this week, I hope you find your way back onto Modern at Grace Avenue. Go in peace. <laughs>